willingness even in the face of some physical infirmities to come and lead the singing and, 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 and let us enjoy his ministry and uh, his family and Greg and the bringing him over and driving him and so forth. It's a, it's a privilege when you have the opportunity to fellowship with people that, uh, you know, have, have what Ed Erickson used to call long legs in the ministry, been around a long time. And uh, for you younger people, it's, it's something that you need to count as a privilege to get to know some of these older brothers. I used to say that, now I'm one of the older brothers. <laughs> you can skip me, but these other guys, it's good for you to know. All right, Romans chapter number uh, 5 in one hand, and Romans chapter 3 in the other. Romans chapter 5 and Romans chapter number 3. My topic tonight is the glory of God. And what I want to do is, is to talk with you a little bit about it in the context of not... <laughs> Not quite the way usually we talk about it. What does God think His glory is? You know, that, we, we say, do, whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Do all to the glory of God. And usually we mean by that, do something so that God is honored and spoken well of and everybody thinks good of Him. But when God talks about His glory, He's talking about something very specific. Much different than what we usually think about in that regard. Romans chapter 3, verse 23, you know this verse. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Now, notice the contrast in chapter 5. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace when we stand and rejoice in, the, in hope of the glory of God. You've, you've had a, between chapter 3 and chapter 5, you've had a complete, total change in your relationship as a believer to the glory of God. One, you came short of it, now being justified through the Lord, by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. By being justified before God based upon what Jesus Christ did for you at Calvary. Justification is God declaring you righteous based upon who His Son is. God made Him to be sin for you, that you might be made the righteousness of God in Him. And when you trusted the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, God literally took you out of an identity in Adam and placed you into an identification in the Lord Jesus Christ. I've said it thousands of times. God looks at a, at a group of people like this, looks down at the planet, and He only sees two kinds of people. He doesn't see Baptist, Methodist, Free Will Baptist. There's about 280 different kinds of Baptists. He doesn't see any of that. He doesn't see Catholics. He doesn't see Pentecostals. He doesn't see grace believers. He sees people in Adam or people in Christ. He doesn't see Muslims. He doesn't see Shiite, Shias and, and, and Sunnis. And He doesn't see Hindus and Buddhists and Taoists. He sees you're in Adam or you're in Christ. That's the way God looks at it. Now, man looks at it differently, but that's how God looks at it. When, you come, when He takes you out of Adam and puts you into Jesus Christ, He does that. The moment you trust the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, God, the Holy Spirit, takes you and He baptizes you into one body. That's why the issue of baptism is such a controversial thing in Christianity. Because it's the key linchpin, it's the mechanics of identification truth. It's how God takes you out of Adam and puts you into Christ. And if the adversary can get religion to hide that truth from you, you'll never have an understanding of who he's really made you. That's where the real crux comes in. So you've been changed from coming short of the glory of God to rejoicing in the hope of the glory of God. God's glory gives you a hope that is steadfast and sure. When Christ is our life shall appear, then shall we appear with Him in glory. So you've got a hope. You've got a future connected with, with that glory. But what, when it talks about the glory of God, the idea of glory is, is, the, is the outshining, the manifestation, the demonstration of, of His excellence. But now what does that mean? Well, if you go back with me to Exodus 33, this is a passage that's always just, for me, it, it comes to my mind. Because in Exodus 33, Moses wants to know about what God's glory is. In Exodus chapter 33, and boy, you know, when I go here in my mind, the whole context of the book of Exodus jumps up on the fr in my frame of reference. And, and I, I, wish it, I, I wish I could believe it does with you. I, I know most of you probably doesn't. But this is a key point in the life of Israel. Moses has been up on the mount. He's come down. There's this strange noise, in, the noise of battle down here. He's come down here. He's found him building the golden calf and all, you know, all that stuff that went on in, in, in the valley while he's up on the mountain. And Moses has basically had it with the nation of Israel. He's, he looks at him and says, Lord, what am I going to do with this stiff-necked bunch of people that belong to you? <laughs> he, he, he's, he's had it with them. 
And he's, he's wanting to know, now if I got to lead these people, what chance do I have? Chapter 33, verse 14. Start in verse 11. The Lord spake unto Moses face to face, as a man speaketh unto his friend. There's nobody at this time he did that with but Moses. You remember Miriam and Aaron tried to make out like he did. You remember what God did to them? Now go back and... Numbers chapter 11 and read it sometime. Numbers chapter 12, you ought to go read that. It's kind of serious. If, if you, you, better, you read that, you better thank God for His grace, for the dispensation of grace, because if you live back under the law, a lot of you would wind up being leprous tonight. That's what happened to them. Number 16, Korah, Kor, Dathan, and Abiram said, You take too much on yourself, Moses. Listen, God talked to you. know what happened to them? The earth opened up, and wow, they went down alive into the pit. They had a big sinkhole, and it sucked them down. Covered them up. Not like a sinkhole in Florida. This one covered itself up. And they were gone. You know what would happen if you lived under the law today? God says, Paul's your apostle. I mean, preachers better thank God for his grace. Even if they don't know about it. Even if they think they're living under the law. Boy, if you were, you in trouble. There'd be a whole lot less preachers around. Because they, th they, they, they want to make themselves the authority. God spoke face to face to Moses. He spoke face to face to Paul. Moses is the great lawgiver to Israel. Paul is the great grace, great grace giver to us. These are, these are important men in the, in the Bible. Verse number 12, Moses said unto the Lord, See, thou sayest unto me, Bring up this people, and thou hast not let me know whom thou wilt send with me. Yet thou hast said, I know the, uh, thee by name, and 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 thou hast also found grace in my sight. Now therefore I pray thee, if I have found grace in thy sight, show me now thy way, that I may know thee, that I may find grace in thy sight, and consider that this nation is thy people. And he said, God says to Moses, My presence shall go with thee, and I will give thee rest. Now that's a great promise. God says, I'm going to send my presence with you. Well, that doesn't make Moses real happy. So verse number 18, Moses said, I beseech thee, show me thy glory. What I want you to see there is how God says, I'll send my presence. Moses says, show me your glory. See the connection between God's presence and his glory? When God manifests his presence, there is an outshining, a demonstration of his glory. Moses wants to see it. So God says to him, I will make all my goodness pass before thee, and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before thee. Verse 20 says, Thou canst not see my face, for there, there should no man see my face and live. The Lord said, Behold, there is a place by me. Thou shalt stand upon a rock, and it shall come to pass, while my glory passeth by, that I will put thee in the cliff of the rock, and will cover thee with my hand while I pass up by. And I will take away my hand, and thou shalt see my back parts, but my face shalt thou uh, shalt not be seen. Notice he's going to cause his glory to pass by in front of Moses. He's going to hide him so it doesn't blind him, but he's going to cause his glory to pass by in front of Moses, and he's going to allow Moses to see the result of that glory passing by, the hinder part. Now, what did he show Moses when Moses saw the glory go by? Verse Chapter 34, verse 5. And the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. Now, that's what he told him back in 33, 19 he's going to do. Well, what does he do when he proclaims the name of the Lord? When you proclaim the name of the Lord, what, what do you, what, you know, when you say the name, of, I'm going to proclaim to you who God, I'm going to show you who I am, the essence of who I am. The Lord passed by before him, verse 6, and proclaimed, the Lord, the Lord God, merciful, gracious, long-suffering, abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, and that will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers unto the children, upon the children's children, upon the third, under the third and fourth generation. 
And he said, well, what was he doing? What was that all about? He said, I'm going to show you my glory. And then when he showed him his glory, what he did is he started telling him what he's like. He's gracious. He's merciful. He's, he, he, he's uh, forgiving. He's, he, he's long-suffering. He's full of goodness and truth. He began to describe the essence of the character of God. And when you're talking about merciful and, and, and gracious and, and, and forgiving and, and, and just and so forth, not clearing the guilty, you're talking about how God thinks. You're talking about how he relates to, 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 to his surroundings, how he relates to us, how he relates to others. The glory of God is just the manifestation of what makes him tick. If I say it that way, you won't think I'm being irreverent, but I'm trying to get it across to you, okay? The glory of God is what God wants you to see about how He operates, how He lives, how He thinks, how He relates. Come with me, if you will, to Ezekiel chapter number 1. There's a fascinating thing about God's glory. Uh, Brother Morris Chestnut, years ago, down in Conference and Ridge Farm, was going over this, and I thought, wow, that's... Uh, he's one brought this to my attention years ago. Morris doesn't think I ever learned anything from him, but I occasionally I do. Usually it's in the book of Genesis, but this time it was in Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter 1, Ezekiel sees the glory of God. Chapter 1, verse 28. And the appearance of the bow that is, that is in the cloud in the day of the rain, of rain, so as the appearance of the, cloud, of the bow in the, in the cloud in the day of rain, that's a rainbow, Okay. I'm talking about the gay pride crowd. They don't have a rainbow. They got stuff missing out of it. This is the real rainbow. So was the appearance of the brightness round about the throne of God. This is the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. So God's glory, when it's manifested, you know, you go back in Exodus and it talks about the glory of God filling the tabernacle. Remember that? That glory was a light. But it wasn't just a, a, a white light shining. Did you see these new flashlights they're trying to sell you, the Shadowhawk flashlights that, you know, you can use them and blind somebody with them, that kind of stuff? You, have you seen that? You don't see that? Well, okay. I bought one. It's a waste of your money. Keep your money. <laughs> they said, $49. We'll sell it to you for 19 I said, well, you know, maybe I'll try it because it'll keep my wife from having to buy a gun. And it, forget it. It don't work. But it shines up white light and lights stuff up. But the light of the glory of God isn't a white light. It's a light like a rainbow. Now, what is a rainbow? That's light, but it's light refracted through a prism of water where you see all of the various colors of the rainbow. Now, you, you know how color works and how vision works. You look around at all these different colors here tonight, and that has to do with, the, with, the, with the, those, all those colors are in, in, in light, and part of them are reflected back. So what happens with the light is that it's all, you, you're able to see all of the parts of the light. The glory of God is God demonstrating to you all of the facets of His character. Now, Paul says he dwells in the light to which no man can approach. So this is, this, is some, this is the way the essence of God demonstrates itself all through the Bible. And when you see the glory of God, what you're looking at is the way God makes himself manifest. By the way, that light, it's a, he, Psalm 104 says he covers himself with, with a garment of light. Remember that verse? Please say yes. Take my word for it. Psalm 104, verse 1 to 3. Okay, you read it sometime. If God covers himself with a garment of light, and that light is really a rainbow light, who had the original coat of many colors? See, it wasn't Joseph. It was God himself. And when he created Adam in the earth and made him in his likeness and in his image, you know what he did? He gave Adam a covering of light that looked like his light, so that when people saw Adam and they saw the Lord Jesus Christ, and the Lord Jesus Christ had this covering, this coat of many colors, they saw Adam, they said, there's, those two are together. And he gave Adam an identifying mark. That's why when he, when, when, when he, when he sinned, and he lost that coat of many colors. What's happening with Joseph is he's restoring back some things that he gave Adam. 
God's purpose in the earth through Israel. That's commercial. That's not part of this. But it's, it, it, I, I said it so you understand the fascinating connections that this stuff can have. So what God, come with me to John chapter number 17. This stuff about the glory of God, I'm just trying to make the point to you to start with that God's glory is not just that he wants you to brag about him. It's that he wants you to see why he's worthy of being honored. He wants you to see the facets of his character that make him someone to stand in awe of. He wants you to understand how he thinks, how he responds, how he lives. The reason for that's in John 17. Now, this is the Lord Jesus Christ the night before he dies, and this is what would properly be called the Lord's Prayer. These words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour is come. Glorify thy Son, that thy Son may glorify thee. As thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. And this is life eternal. Now, here's a good verse. You need to remember this one. You want to know what eternal life is? The gift of God is each everlasting life, eternal life to everyone that believes. You want to know what you got when you got saved? Well, this verse tells you. Here is, here's what eternal life is. This is a life eternal that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. Now that word know there in the Bible is an interesting word. It doesn't mean just, hi, I know that person. Who, what's, what's their name? I know them. I know them. You've done that this week, haven't you? Know them, that word know in the Bible, it's used back in Genesis 4. It said that Adam knew his wife, and she conceived and had a son. They had a, a personal, intimate relationship where they knew one another. That's that word. To know God isn't just to say, oh, hi, how are you? is to have the ability to personally know him in a personal, intimate communion and way where he becomes your friend, your lover, if you want to say it that way. You have that intimate, personal. Eternal life is to know him in a personal, intimate way so that you have a connection with the Father through the Son. It's not just living forever. You're going to live forever anyway. Okay? Heaven, hell, like a fire. You're going to live forever. It isn't just existing forever. I mean, that would get kind of boring. I tell people all the time, eternity for the believer is not sitting on a cloud, floating on a cloud, playing a harp, drinking mint julep. I don't know about you, but I tried to teach myself to play the piano. I, I, I taught myself to play the banjo years ago. Morris down there, we'd go down there, the guy play the banjo. Jody wanted to play the banjo. We bought him a banjo. He spent six months, quit. It keeps sitting in the family room. And I thought, you know, I paid a hundred bucks for that thing. I ought to get something out of it. So I spent lunch every day for about six, seven months when Fran was there and taught myself to play the banjo. I satisfied my itch. I, I don't do it anymore because it hurts, hurts your fingers like the Dickens, you know. And anyway, I, I, so I can't play the banjo. I I got, a, I got a gig. I'm going to learn to play the guitar. So I bought me a guitar. I'm going to give that to my grandkids. Uh, <laughs> I, I need to be able to plunk the key and let the, let the striking be done otherwise. But, you know, <laughs> eternal life isn't just... I'd get, I would get as bored as I could be playing a harp. I'd need more than a little mint julep to keep doing that. Forever? Oh. We're going to go catch rainbow trout out of the stream of life. I like to fish, but that gets old too. That's not, that's the people's mind, idea about what heaven and eternal life. Eternal life is not just I'm living, it's to live the, quali the same quality of life that God himself has that he gives to you. So it's important to understand the kind of life that the Godhead lives. Come with me to Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter number 2. The Apostle Paul gives you a, an insight into the, the kind of thinking that goes into the life that God lives. 
Philippians chapter number 2. <clears throat> this is how the Godhead lives. By the way, I hope you, you, you'll, you'll, you'll catch on a little while to the madness of today's messages. We started out with a lesson Alan did on the Godhead. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Three people in the Godhead. The only three people in the universe who are God is God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. People have a hard time with the idea of the Godhead. It's not that hard. You see this room? The 200 people in this room. Give or I don't know how many people here. Say there's 200 people here. You're all equally human. Look around at yourselves. You are a bunch of different looking dudes. I mean, some of you are real different. But we're all equally human. God has made of one blood all the, men, all, all, all the nations to dwell upon the face of the earth. So we are equally human. In our essence, in our being, we're one. In our persons, we are hundreds of us. So you can understand how you, you can be one in essence and being of deity and three in, 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 in people, separate people. The Trinity is not one person manifesting himself in three ways. It's one essence of Godhead shared by three distinct separate people. That's critical to understand. In fact, it is required to have three of them. You don't need more, but you've got to have at least three. And the creation we live in is created by a Godhead of three people, and that's why it's stamped on the creation. Because it's the manifestation of who God is in His thinking. So, it's a, so we started out talking about the Godhead, Father, Son, Holy Ghost. The next topic was it's all about Jesus. Because who's the manifest person of the Godhead? If you're going to understand God, you're going to have to look at Him. How would God live in His creation? Look at Jesus. So it's all about Jesus. And then the third one was you got to have a book to get this. You'll never get any of this if you don't believe your Bible. If you're, te if you're trusting your doctrinal statements and your confessions, you'll never get any of this. Because all you'll have as an authority is a bunch of dumb church fathers. You know how reliable church fathers are? Did you ever read 2 Timothy when Paul said, last thing he wrote to Timothy before he dies, to prepare Timothy for what life after the, the, the New Testament is written, he said, all that in Asia for, turn away from me. So when you read the church, the early church fathers, go back and read them. I've read them, what are called the Antinicene fathers. You read them. They're a bigger bunch of heretics you couldn't find. There's not a mid-Acts dispensationalist in the bunch. And the one or two guys that come close to being dispensationalists get run out of town on a rail. And you study church history today, and, and everybody tells you they're heretics. You know who writes church history? Roman Catholics and Roman Catholic sympathizing Protestants. You know what Roman Catholics and Roman Catholic sympathizing Protestants think you are? A heretic. So when I hear them calling somebody a heretic, I go say, who were, who were they? Let me go read what they said. But you can't read what they said because they're heretics, so they burned everything they wrote. So whose word have I got for it? They're enemies. I don't know about you, but and I know it's hard to believe. I have a couple of enemies in the world. <laughs> Sweet little old me. And you can listen to what they say that I teach, and you'd never know me. But the problem they have is people do know me. That a guy spent, spent stuff all over the world. Saying, Jordan teaches this. And he, get, he kept getting people writing back. said, no, he doesn't. He said, well, how do you know? said, I've listened to 100 hours of his teaching tapes. And they don't, he doesn't say that. And he says, oh, well, then he just doesn't really tell you what he believes. <laughs> when was the last time you noticed I didn't tell you what I thought? <laughs> Sometime I tell you things I, things I haven't thought yet. So he says, well, you need, if you want to know what Richard thinks, ask me, I'll tell you. Now, see, 
that's, that's, that's nothing special with me. They do that to all these preachers. That's the way it's done. If you don't have a book, if you're going to ch use church history and systematic theology and the confessions of the faith, this is how it's always been taught, you know what you do? You wave by to the Bible. This has got to be based on the book. If it's going to be your faith resting in what God says, you've got to have a book. So we talk about the Godhead. We talk about the manifest person is Jesus, and you've got to get it out of the book. So now I'm going to talk to you about the glory of God manifest in the Godhead, centered in the Lord Jesus Christ, taught to you about his word. That was my, the method of the madness to get us where we are. Philippians 2, verse 3. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, now underline this, esteem, let each esteem other better than themselves. You see that? Let each esteem others better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Now that doesn't mean don't look at your stuff, go see what you can steal somebody else has got. He says you're looking after what other people, you're not looking after yourself, you're looking after them. Esteem others better than you. Make their interests more important to you than your interest is. Live for other people. Now verse 5. Let this mind be in you, which was also where? Who's the first, the original person who had the thought to esteem others better than themselves? That's the mindset that the Lord Jesus Christ had. What did he do? Who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, took upon him the form of a servant, and made in the likeness of man, and being found in the fashion of man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. There he is, God, equal with, with the other members of the Godhead, and yet he doesn't make himself of any reputation. He doesn't live for his own esteem. He esteemed the Father and the Son, the Spirit, better, more important than himself, and he lived for them. Every member of the Godhead lives for the glory and the benefit of the other members of the Godhead. No member of the Godhead lives for his own self. Eternal life, the life of the Godhead, is to spontaneously live for the benefit of the others in the Godhead. It's fascinating to watch that happen in the Bible. Come with me, if you will, to Colossians chapter 1. If you talk to God the Father, and you say, Father, what is it that thrills your heart? If I ask you tonight, what would, what would be the most thrilling thing happening in your life? Would it be something happened to others or something happened to you? Now, you know, Dave looks at his wife back there and he says, oh, it would have to be happening to her. But she's his wife. If it happens to her, it happens to him. Because he belongs to her and she belongs to him. So that doesn't count. <laughs> you know what we do? When we want to say, what... A, what do we say? We think something about us. Father, what would be the, what's the greatest, most thrilling thing that happens in your life? Colossians 1, verse 18. He is the head. Christ is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. Why? That in all things he might have preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. You know what the Father believes? He believes that Jesus Christ is worthy to be the preeminent one in all the creation because the Father glories in His Son. God, Listen, God the Father believes that if you were to see the value and the excellence, the treasure, if you were to cherish His Son the way He does, you'd fall in love with Him the way He loves Him. And you'd share the love that they had before the world began, that John 17 says. The Father is convinced that if you could just see what He sees in His Son, you'd love Him like He does. Because everything the Father does, He focuses on His Son. Come back with me, if you will, to John chapter 3. The book of John is a fascinating book. You see it, you see the Word made flesh. You see God living in our humanity in the book of John. John 3, verse 35. The Father loveth the Son 
and giveth all things into his hands. God the Father esteems his Son above everything else. Come on to chapter 5. And gives, gives everything, just turns it over to him. Chapter 5, verse 20. The Father loveth the Son, and showeth him all things that himself doeth. And he will show him greater works than these, that ye may marvel. For as the Father raiseth up the dead, and quickeneth them, even so the Son quickeneth whom he will. For the Father judgeth no man, but hath committed all judgment unto his Son. He said, I trust my Son to act in my behalf, and I trust, I believe in him. I He's the most important. Everything the Father does is for the benefit of His Son. God the Father doesn't live for Himself. He lives for the, His Son. He also, come with me to Second Peter chapter 1, feels the same way about the Holy Spirit, the third member of the Godhead. Second Peter chapter 1. Get Second Peter chapter 1 in one hand and, and Psalm 138. Second Peter and Psalm 138. Second Peter chapter 1. Psalm 138. Second Peter chapter 1, Brother Fred read this passage this morning, verse 21. Second Peter 1, 21, But the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. So how did the, how did the Word of God come about? The Holy Spirit spoke it. So that book was given to you by the Holy Spirit. How does the Father, how does God the Father think about the work product of the Holy Spirit? Look at Psalm 138, verse 2. I will worship toward thy holy temple and praise thy name for thy loving kindness, for thy truth, for thou hast magnified thy word. What is his word? It's the work product of the Holy Spirit. I've magnified the work product of the Holy Spirit above He's magnified it above His name. My point to you is that God the Father doesn't live so He can beat His chest and have, have other members of the Godhead say, Whoo, aren't you wonderful? He lives to serve and esteem them. That's the, that's the kind of life He gave you. Is the capacity to live spontaneously for the benefit of others. Go back with me, if you will, to, to John chapter 17. Notice the Lord Jesus Christ. He felt the same way. The, the Lord Jesus Christ, John chapter 17. We, we read this. We didn't get this far in that passage a minute ago. Verse 5, John 17, 5. Now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. Glorify me with the glory I had with you. I want your glory. You know what he said in John, in, in, in Hebrews 10, time's sake, I'm just going to have to, I'll just quote the verses. In Hebrews 10, quoting Psalm 40, he says, I come to do thy will. Jesus is talking. Oh, God. You know what Jesus did when he stepped out of heaven and became a, he took on a form of man? He came to do the will of his Father. That's what he esteemed. If you look there at John chapter, go back to chapter 5, where we read a minute ago. John 5, in his humanity... The Lord Jesus Christ says, verse 19, the man Christ Jesus says, then, now he's God, he's the God man. He came to have deity, God, the Son, live in our humanity. How does the life of God live in our humanity? Verse 19, then answered Jesus and said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, the Son can do nothing of himself, but what he seeth the Father do, for what things soever he doeth, these also doeth the Son likewise. That's a fascinating verse, isn't it? The Son can do nothing of Himself. Could He? Matthew chapter 9, He says to a guy, He says, Thy sins be forgiven thee. Only God can forgive sin. Were the guy's sins forgiven? Sure. Why? Because He's God. But Jesus didn't do that on His own initiative. He did that in obedience to his Father's will. You follow that? So when he says the Son can do nothing of himself, that is, I'm not living in self-will. I'm living to do the will of my Father. What is it that's most important? He said, the words that I speak to you, they're not mine. They're the words your Father gave me. My point to you is that each member of the Godhead lives to glorify and honor and serve the other members of the Godhead. 
Come with me to Luke chapter number 4. Same attitude about the Holy Spirit. Luke chapter 4, verse 18. Jesus is quoting Isaiah. He says in verse 18, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, to send, to, to send me, uh, he hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, to recover a sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that, that, that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book, verse 21, he said unto them, uh, began to say unto them, uh, uh, then he began to say unto them, this day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. So who is it and who is it that's causing the Lord Jesus Christ to be able to do all of these things? He doesn't say, I'm doing all this. It's my power. It's my ability. It's my will. He said it's the Father's will and it's the Spirit's anointing. He's depending on the, Holy, the, the, the members of the Godhead to, to, to do. He's not making himself of any reputation. Every, the glory of God is the capacity that the Godhead has to live spontaneously for the benefit of others to esteem the other members of the Godhead better than themselves and to live for them. Come with me to, uh, well, you don't need me to do this. Second Timothy 3, he says, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God, spoken by God, the Holy Spirit. But when God, the Holy Spirit, talks about the Bible, you know what he says in Isaiah 34? He said, seek ye out the book of the Lord and read. He's talking about God the Father. The Holy Spirit doesn't claim to himself, woo-hoo, you read the book I wrote? You see guys write books and they, they you know, I wrote 20 books. He wrote 15 books. I wrote 80 books. And they got it in a brag sheet. The Holy Spirit didn't. The Holy Spirit wrote 66 perfect books. And he doesn't brag about any of them. He says, they're the, seek ye out the book of the Lord. I'm just trying to say to you that the glory of God has to do with God. Come with me to Ephesians chapter 1. When you think about God's glory, it's the life that God lives. It's the life that the Godhead lives and shares among itself. And the way they live, they live spontaneously for the benefit of the other members of the Godhead. Never for, they esteem other better than themselves. That's their mindset. Now, when you grasp that, you're kind of ready to understand Ephesians 1.17. Paul is praying that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened. When he says he wants to give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation, that's not talking about giving you the Holy Spirit. They already have the Holy Spirit. They're already saved people. Verse 13 and 14 has already informed them about being sealed with the Spirit when they trusted the gospel of their salvation. When he says, give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation, that word spirit there is not talking about the Holy Spirit. It's talking about an attitude. For example, he talks in one place about the people having the spirit of slumber. Now, that's not some sweet, sweet spirit in this place that puts somebody to sleep. He talks about the, uh, the spirit of bondage. He's talking about the attitude. Listen, there is an attitude that God wants you to have that you will have if you have the wisdom and revelation given. It's, it's the attitude that the wisdom and revelation of the commissary to Paul will give you. Have you ever noticed that it just gives you an attitude? Now, you know, most of us have an attitude problem with it. But the attitude that it's designed to give you is the attitude of the Godhead. Not esteeming yourself better than others, that's your flesh. But the Paul says, I want you to have the spirit of wisdom and revelation. In the, I want you to have the impact of this great truth in your life the way God designed it to be. And he calls God there the Father of glory. Now that term glory 
is a title for the plan that the Father has for His creation. If you look back in verse 9, you'll see it. Ephesians 1, 9. Having made known unto us the mystery of His will, that's the Father, according to the good pleasure of His, which He purposed in Himself. Back here before the world began, the Godhead meets together, and they plan something. When Jesus Christ stepped out as the creator God on nothing and created the heaven and the earth, he didn't just stand up and say, well, I wonder what I can do today. Modern art. No. He, he sat out there. Go read it in Proverbs 3 and Proverbs 8. He had a plan already that the Godhead had determined what they were going to do. What that plan was is in verse 10. That in the dispensation of the fullness of, the, of, of times, he would gather together. That's going to over here. He's going to gather together in one all things in Christ. He, that he would gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are in earth. Now, the things that he's talking about in heaven, Colossians 1.16, is the government. Not just the physical creation, but the government designed to operate the, system, the, the creation. The things in earth, Colossians 1.16, the thrones of principalities and dominions in the earth that are designed to... When you have a government, it's designed to carry out a purpose. The will of the king. And he has a mechanism, a, 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 a mechanism to carry out his will and his plan. God has a plan for creation. He had a purpose for creation. He established a mechanism to carry out that purpose. His glory is the purpose. Now, his purpose was to gather it all together in one, in Christ Jesus, to make Jesus Christ the head. You see, the Father's plan is to manifest who he is, how he thinks, what delights his heart, which is the Lord Jesus Christ, in all of his creation. He's determined to do it in two realms, the earth and the heaven. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was that form and void. And from Genesis 1, 2, all the way to the time you come to the ministry of the Apostle Paul, the focus is on God's plan in the earth. Then God sets, he interrupts that plan and reveals, he said, I had a, <clears throat> there's another aspect to my plan. i am also got a plan for the heavens. But he needs another agency for the heavens because the, the nation Israel does, does just fine in the earth. We're of the earth earthy. Mud man, you can, you can work the earth. But for you to be in the heavens, to have an agency that goes into the heavens and carries on the government up there, you've got to have a new kind of humanity. So what does he do? Jesus Christ becomes the firstborn from the dead so that he might be the head of the body so he can have preeminence not just in the earth but in the heavenly places. So God's got this one great plan to glorify His Self in His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, in two realms, in the heavens and in the earth. So He has to have two agencies, one in the earth and one in the heavens, but one great purpose. And when He says there, He's going to gather them together in one. Everything's going to think like the head thinks. <laughs> you know how you get together, you all speak the same thing, you all think the same thing? He's going to gather them together... The body of Christ is the great example. We're many members, but one body. Remember that? And we all the diversity, but we work together as one body, working together. God's purpose is to take his creation and turn it into a living manifestation of how he thinks, how he operates, how he responds. And he's going to put it all into the headship of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, the Lord Jesus Christ is going to be the brains of the outfit, of course, because he's the head. He'll be located, planet Earth, and it'll be the command center. But all through the universe, for him to think it'll be for you to do it. For him to purpose it, be for you, will it but will be for you to accomplish it. And he'll have this whole universe gathered together as one functioning unit. Sometimes people say, well, aren't we going to be on the earth when Jesus comes? Because the Bible says, forever we shall ever be with the Lord. Have you ever thought about how dumb that is? I mean, I hear a smart preacher saying it, but it's a dumb thing to say. You can be smart and dumb at the same time. 
Now you can be well educated and dumb at the same time. <laughs> that verse says, so should we ever be with the Lord. That, now, how, how close to him physically do you have to be to be with him? I mean, how many members of the body of Christ are there in 2,000 years? Well, just say a million. Let's, let's take a ridiculously low number. A million. Have you ever seen a million people? I was on the Sears Tower down there one time when, when they were having a rally in, in uh, Grant Park. It's after one of the, the, the Bulls get, uh, wins. Ancient history. <laughs> and we were up on the Sears Tower looking down, and there were two million people in Grant Park. Grant Park. And you know, those two million people were trying to look at Michael Jordan and all those guys. And you know, you couldn't even, you couldn't have seen him with, a, with, a, with, a, you know, well, with binoculars, you could have seen him, but they'd have been about that big. And you could say, we were with him. But you know, when I think about being with somebody, I'm thinking like David sitting there, I would shake his hand, I'm with him. You can be with somebody and can't see them because you're down in Grant Park with them. I'm in Chicago. My wife's got family, and I have family down in Alabama. Are we with them? Well, we're, we're, we're in the United States with them. If I want to say I'm here in the States with, you know, I'm here in the States with them. But we're not. You see, that term doesn't have proximity in the issue. When he says we'll be with the Lord, he's not talking about you're going to be. It's not talking about nearness because it'll be impossible to everybody to be near him. Have you ever heard when Jesus said, if you're not for me, you're against me. If you're not with me, you're against me. What does that mean? If I'm with somebody, I'm in agreement with them. I'm thinking like they're thinking. I'm with you. I got you. That's the way that word is. When it says, so should we ever be with the Lord, you're never going to have any problem agreeing with the Lord, disagreeing with the Lord again. You're always going to be one with him. You follow that? You don't follow that. You do follow that. That's exciting. You're sitting there like, hmm, okay, Brother Rick. Oh, okay, maybe you knew all that. I knew it. All, I knew it already too. But it excites me. I can't just say, <laughs> "Okay, I'm getting out." You're getting out in about five minutes. I'm gonna scare my wife to death if we did that. <laughs> the point is that God's the He has this plan, the Father, to make His Son the head of every. Here's this plan. He calls it glory. I'm going to manifest the life of the Godhead. And it's really all about the Lord Jesus Christ making him the head of all things. Gathering it all together so that we all function together as one unit. So that our life, our ministry, his presence, and all of creation is going to be a manifestation of his plan and purpose. Put on display. I love that verse in chapter 2 when he says that in the ages to come he might show forth the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us. You know what exceeding riches are? You've got some riches, then you get some more and they're, they're exceeding, they're more better. Then you get some more and they're more better. Did you ever do that? I think about, do you like peach cobbler? Adam goes out the first day he, in the garden. He says, what you going to do today, honey? He says, I'm, I think I'm just going to go out and check out the peach orchard. He comes back in that afternoon, comes back in for lunch, and he says, look at these beautiful peaches I got. And he says, they're just wonderful. And they sit down at the table, and they slice those peaches, and they eat them. And he says, you know, Sugar, I don't think anything could be any better than that. Okay, I'm going to go back to work. And he says, Sugar, hmm, wonder if I sliced them up and put sugar on them, what would happen? If you've ever eaten a good Georgia peach, you know, the ripe, oh, it's wonderful. But if you ever take it and slice it and put sugar on it and put it in the fridge overnight. <coughs> this past week, my wife made some strawberry shortcake or made some strawberries and sugared them up to take the shortcake. And she threatened me with life and limb, didn't she? 
They know they ate some of it. And it, 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 I couldn't go in there and eat any of those strawberries. So, you know what? I Now, you tell her. I'm going to know if you tell her this. <laughs> I went in and took the strawberries out and took a spoon, pushed out, and just got some of the juice. <laughs> I didn't eat the strawberries because that's what she said. <laughs> but I got some of that. Oh, and it's so good. <coughs> peaches are good. Sliced peaches with sugar on them is exceedingly good. So he gives, she, she gets that. And he says, oh, baby, this it's even better. He goes out the next day and she says, you know, he worked so hard. I wonder if I made him a cobbler if he'd like that. So she takes that peaches and makes a peach cobbler. Now, I don't know about you, but I love peaches. I like sliced peaches that are sugared up. But, ooh, doggy, you got a peach cobbler. And you're calling my name. I didn't get like this without working at it. <laughs> one is good. Then here's one that exceeds in goodness. And here's another one that exceeds that in goodness. You know what, you know what eternity is going to be for us? Ages that never end. And each age, there's going to be an exceeding appreciation of who Jesus Christ is than we had before. You're never going to come to the end of growing in an appreciation of His grace and His kindness toward us through Jesus Christ. You'll never come to the end of all that God's provided for you in His Son. Amen. The Father believes that if you could see all that He sees in His Son, you would love Him like He does. You're going to spend eternity just over and over and over and over and over and over again doing what the Father's will is, falling in love with the lover of your soul. That's the glory of God. That's how God lives. Now look at chapter 3 and we'll quit. Verse number 9. Maybe. Chapter 3, verse 9. Verse 8, he says, Unto me who am less than the least of all saints is great this grace given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. And Paul doesn't just want to preach the unsearchable riches of Christ and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world has been hid in God. You see, when he says that phrase, to make all men see the fellowship of the mystery, that phrase is used incorrectly most of the time because he's not simply saying make people understand it. 1 Corinthians 2.14 says, A natural man receives not the things of the Spirit of God. How could you make an unsaved man see what he can't see? He's wanting all men to see. What he's talking about there is what's, what he's going to take up in chapter 4 is he's going to do, he's going to, talking about here's this unsearchable riches of Christ that he puts into the body of Christ, his life in the body of Christ, and then he puts himself on display Second Corinthians 4.10 says he, that Christ is manifest in our mortal flesh. And what we do as believers, and especially the functioning of the local church, because you get in Ephesians 4 to 6, and the whole focus turns from the body of Christ in general to its manifestation in the local church. And what God's desire is for you and me in our ministry, in our lives, whether it's your life as an individual where you are, and then your ministry is to put on display this fellowship that you and I have, this sharing of the life of God, this ability to have the mind of Christ to esteem others better than ourselves, and to put it on display so that it's not simply understood cognitively, it's understood demonstratively in our life, in our walk. And it's according to the eternal purpose, verse 11, which he purposed in Christ Jesus. That thing back there in the future, in, in eternity past, is being accomplished, that he's going to do out there, he's putting it on display in his body right now. And as we have Christ manifest in us, 1 Timothy 3, 6, 15 talks about the church of the living God. And it does it. In the context of greatest the mystery of God on us, God was manifest in the flesh. 
He's put his life, just like he put his life on display in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, he puts his life, the life of Christ, on display in the body of Christ. And the glory of God that we're going to share out here in the ages to come in that exceeding manifestation, we don't have to wait. It's ours now. And our ministry now is whether it's in our individual lives or the ministries that we have together in the work of the ministry, we put that eternal purpose on display in the details of our life and in our ministry. When he says we do all to the glory of God, he's talking about we're doing it in whatever we do, word or deed, is to manifest his life and his purpose. And what that is, just the passage to close with is 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Think of some little, I mean, think of yourself, <laughs> the mud man that you are. And Paul says, we have this treasure in an earthen vessel. You have the treasure of the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, our Lord, in you. It's in an earthen vessel. You should never get to thinking too much of the vessel because you're just an old crack pot. It's the treasure inside of you that's the real issue. You see, all this stuff up here about the right division, the understanding of it, is so you can understand the life that God gave you, what His purpose is. If you're back over here trying to act like Israel, you're not carrying out the glory of God. Because you aren't Israel. That's not what God's doing today. To follow, the, have the glory of God, you've got to understand who you are. Understand who you are. How does that operate? How does that work? How does this function? This is where the glory of God operates today. Today, today. This is what God's do. Here's his life in operation. That's your flesh. That's religion. Here's God's work, God's life. But it isn't enough to know where it is. It's necessary to get it and to have it live, be our life. Second Corinthians 4, verse 3. For our gospel will be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world has blinded the minds of them that believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ should shine, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. For God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness... Let there be light. Hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. You know the song that says, Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of this world will grow strangely dim in the light of His glory and grace. That's why to write to divide the Word. That's why it's important. People say, boy, you do that, you never have a ministry. That's the ministry. People say, you do that, nobody will ever appreciate you. That's the ministry. You say, you do that, you have to leave a church of 300 for a church of six. You heard that a while ago. That's the ministry. All that other stuff isn't the ministry. All that other stuff's just stuff. By the way, look around here. You won't necessarily be alone. Now, there might be a time when you can't have a group. Politically, economically, socially, we're able to do this right now. There are places in the world people like us can't meet together. What's the chaff to the wheat? There's the glory of God. Live in it. And don't let it just be something you know in your head. Let it be something you know in your life. Let it be your life. And where it is is in the face of the Lord Jesus Christ. You're not going to find it looking at me or somebody else. You're going to find it in the Lord Jesus Christ. You're going to find it in the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery. If you could see 
what the Father sees in His Son, you'd love Him the way the Father does. If you never trusted the Lord Jesus Christ today, can I tell you that whatever it is that would keep you from trusting the, the young people out talking to people today and somebody says, I don't believe in God, I don't believe in the Bible. For most of them, I don't know why they would. If you ask the average one of them, what, what, do you, what do you think the Bible's about? What do you think religion's about? I said earlier, they'll hold, hold up a picture of the Pope and the Ayatollah. And if that's what religion's about, count me out. I was in a home a couple of years ago staying with this, this family. And the mom sat down in the kitchen after, in the living room after the meeting that evening and she said, Brother Jordan, we have a real heartache. Our daughter has turned her back on God. She's turned her back on the church. She's turned her back on anything we believe. She's gotten her life messed up with narcotics, drugs, all kind of unseemly things. We don't know what to do. Will you talk to her? We got the preacher here. Talk to her. Magic. And I said, sure, I'd love to talk to her. And I went down to the basement, and she didn't want to talk. So I sat in a chair right next to her, and I said, can I just tell you a story? And I just held this little girl's hand. She was about 18 years old. And I just sat on the, in a, in a did you, do you believe I can sit in an Indian squat? You know what an Indian squat is? <laughs> I can do it. I, I, I can't get up so well, but I can get down. <laughs> And I sat there for about two hours, and I, I just took her by the hand and said, let me tell you a story. And I just told her the story of the gospel about sin and about a God that says, I commend my love towards you and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for you. And how that it was religion that crucified him as much as the sins of man. And you know that little girl... She finally told me, she says, I never heard any of that before. And I don't believe that. But I do believe it. Because sometimes you can hear it and not hear it. Can I tell you tonight, if you're not, if you don't know the Lord, if you don't know for sure that you have eternal life, you're looking other places to get some love and some value and some validation for your life and to have something meaning and meaning. If you're looking anywhere except the Him, can I tell you that whatever you're looking at doesn't love you the way He does? It didn't die for you the way he did. It won't esteem you better than himself. We know the grace of God that though he were rich, yet for your sake he became poor, that you through his poverty might become rich. It'll never save you, but he will. And when he went to Calvary, he went there for you. When he died, he died for you. And he did enough for you. And if you could ever see that and understand that's what thrills the heart of God the Father, that's what God the Father believes will save you. If you ever see that and you cease from your wanderings and going astray and just rest in that, you know what will happen? It will all change for you that instant. Because God will save you. He'll radically change your identity. You don't have to make a deal to give up anything, go anywhere, do anything. You don't have to pray a prayer, a sinner's prayer, anybody else's prayer. All you have to do is the one thing you can do without doing anything, and that's trust His Son. But you do have to do something. You have to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the only thing you can do without it being a work. If you never did that, tonight's the night right where you sit, in the quietness and the stillness of your heart, you tell God you're going to trust His Son. You don't even have to do that. Just trust Him. Then tell Him you did. He already knew you did. My point is you just believe in Put your faith in Him. Rely exclusively on Him. And God will save you. You don't have to tell anybody. We're not going to embarrass you. If you'd like help, 
something you don't know about, can't answer, you got a question about, the people here would be happy to spend all evening with you over an open Bible. You don't need us, you need him. I say that because I sat in meetings just like this for many years in my life, lost as a hound dog on the way to hell. Everybody around me thought I was saved. The night I got saved, I couldn't convince my pastor and the youth leader of the church that I'd got saved because they said, oh, you've been saved all along, Richard. I said, no, I hadn't. They didn't know the struggle that was going on inside of me, but I did. If you trust him, God will save you. And then you'll understand something about the glory of God that you can't understand any other way. And for those of us that are saved, I pray for us that God would make this, that, that we could take our faith and trust his word and make it as real to us as it is to him. Father, we thank you tonight for your son, for yourself, for the great privilege is ours to know you through him. May we fix our hearts and our minds on our Savior and come to love him who has first loved us because of it. We thank you in Christ's name. Amen. We're going to stay.